Why could that be? We think it has to do with this, um, our, one of the, the theme of being a ghost here. First of all, there's no administrative requirement to see fathers. Child welfare policy, legislation, practice standards are constructed using the gender neutral language of parent. And in a society such as ours, where we know that mothers do most of the active caregiving, although that's changing, and I hope it does change more, there's a long tradition, assumption, expectation, that really the care of children, the raising of children, is the mother's task. One of the family therapy books talks about the dominant North American paradigm is uh, mother's care for kids, dad's help out. Um, I don't agree with that, but that's, I, I think, in North American society, uh, certainly dominant North American society, meaning white Euro-Canadian heritage, um, that's a kind of a paradigm, a way of thinking or organizing it. In policy, there's no expectation to see fathers. There's no requirement to see them. There's no uh, expectation that they'd be involved in safety assessments, in planning for children, etc. and so on. When I did my piece of the project, which was to look at to what extent do social workers across Canada get education about fathers and fathering, that there's virtually nothing in the curriculum in a BSW education specifically about fathering. Quebec is different. Quebec is always different. Um, but in English Canadian schools, virtually nothing about fathering. I could find three articles from 22 schools and a whole bunch of course outlines. So training, whether on the job, university, education, and social work, there's, there's no expectation to see fathers in child welfare practice. So here's what some workers say. If I just focus on this one, being trained to get rid of the guy. Last winter, about this time, I had a group of 10 students in a field practicum seminar. We were discussing a child welfare case. Um, the student who was involved with the case presented it. We went round the circle, said what should be done. Repetition of this theme. Tell the mother to pack up her kids, move across town, get a restraining order, start life anew, get dad out of the picture, or the man out of the picture. That's how life is going to be better. That's how she'll get her kids back. Yeah. Um, the other dimension is, um, is the size of caseloads. Uh, if you don't have to do it, if a judge isn't going to ream you out for your incomplete court document, your supervisor isn't going to ream you out, one of the 17 bodies that review the practice of the frontline Child Protection Social Work in BC isn't going to haul you up on the carpet. Why would you do it? You don't have to. There's too many other fires to put out. Administrative practices. Files in BC and in many other jurisdictions in North America are organized by the mother. It's a matrilineal system. Um, I talked briefly about gender neutral language. We use the word parent. But I think parent gets translated in practice to mean mother. Mother has to maintain the safety of her children. Mother has to provide for them. Um, it's mother's job. Um, I can speak a lot about this, but if you look back to the 1950s in this province, a policy manual 
for child welfare practice was about eight pages, eight typewritten pages long. Policy manual today is about 150 pages. There's much more structure, many more rules, many more requirements, um, and the, the emphasis is on efficiency, um, paperwork, etc. Another is what I'm calling, it's a rather technical phrase, a gender division of child welfare practice. 82% of frontline social workers doing Child Protection Canada are women. Uh, probably 75%, although there isn't good data, probably 75% of the managers are men. Um, so what you have is, an, on an ongoing basis, a number of young women who come out of university, not all, but largely young women, who go to work in child welfare. They're much more comfortable dealing with women, young mothers and kids, than they are in dealing with men. Um, and in Canada, we also have an absence of universal income, housing, and childcare policies. If you looked at Sweden, 0.8% of their children are involved in the child welfare system. Unlike 4%, that's like a quarter of the children in Canada. What do they have that we don't have? Universal daycare for everybody? Uh, a minimum income policy. British Columbia, one of the richest provinces in Canada, for six years in a row, has led in child poverty. Child welfare, child protection, is something that affects the poor. And if you look on Stats Canada, you'll find that women are poorer than men in Canada. 70 cents on the dollar hasn't changed much in 30, 40 years. So, limited resources, <clears throat> last resort resources, going for the most and greatest emergencies, the greatest crises, that become the focus of child welfare social workers. Um, we're tending to, um, we don't particularly have any expectations of what men in the lives of child welfare involved children should be doing. We don't require them to attend meetings, although Jonathan Scarfield, who's a writer in this area from Britain, says he thinks policy should change so that any man that's in the house um, of a child welfare involved child should be required to attend assessments. <coughs> um, frequently the violence is ignored. Um, no man that I know of, no father, has ever been found to be neglectful of their children. Why? Because the system of child welfare feeds into um, an implicit assumption in our society that it's mothers who are to be blamed and mothers who are responsible. We use kick the guy out as the treatment option. And, <clears throat> and regard that as success. So there's no, there's no expectation that students learn about fathers, although that's, I can say that's changed in the past year a little bit in a few schools. Um, so one of the other themes that we came up with is seeing the importance of tying the absence of fathers to the blame of mothers. Uh, societally and within our practice and policy around child welfare. Um, the mothers are expected to manage the men in their lives and keep their kids safe from those men.
And I've talked a bit about that, the theme of mom's responsible. Um, it's up to the mom to protect the children. That's why we talk to her. Right? So it's like downloading responsibility onto the mother. Um, when, you, when you start to say, so okay, what are the characteristics of a good father? Um, I got this far in some of my, in my thinking, I think there's probably another half a dozen things you could add on here. If you take off the possibility of good provider by saying the father's unemployed, you take off the possibility of good storyteller because the father might have literacy issues, maybe hasn't finished high school. That can eliminate that and that. Without a job, it's hard to have a car. That eliminates the chauffeur role. So how do you think about fathering and father involvement when you're talking about a poor man who wants to be a good, involved father? I think it's an awful lot more challenging. It seems that the child welfare system is saying, act like a white middle class mother. It's a little bit cynical, this slide, but it's there for that point. Um, do the things that mothers do, and then we're com we'll be comfortable with you. We'll see you as a good dad. Oh, he's such a, I mean, I've heard social workers say this. Oh, I have such great dads in my caseload. You know, they, they're taking full responsibility for the kids. They're really such good guys. They're, um, that's one characteristic of the fathers in child welfare. But the other ones that I know social workers have to deal with are some pretty tough dudes. Um, if I take a social work perspective, I bet these guys have unresolved anger issues. Um, I'd like to know who they grew up with, what their parenting was like, what, who was their fathering role model. But um, they can be violent, they can be abusive, they can be confrontational, they can be controlling, they can be difficult. That's the reality of the work of child welfare. Uh, and that's part of the challenge for social workers. Uh, Mariana was talking about how they're not, not being the safety police. I think um, social workers are the province's safety police. I mean, their fundamental role and function is to assess whether this is a safe living environment for a child. And to make those tough judgment calls about uh, whether one can trust this environment as a good enough environment to raise a child. So um, it's time for mother blame to be out of fashion. Um, to avoid holding mothers responsible for monitoring and controlling men's behavior, it's important to seek out and engage fathers as both risks and assets. Um, one of our participants said, work with me, not work at me. Um, some really practical things. Start from assuming that fathers want to be involved. Um, that's an attitude change. That's a perspective change. I'm really happy to see, now that I've done a couple of presentations with social work groups, um, people are excited by this topic. And they recognize that it's not that hard to change the way you think about practice. You don't have to have policy. You don't have to have somebody say, do this. Uh, you can say, very simply, I'd like to meet your partner. Um, can I come at a time when he's home? I'd like to have a chance to talk to both of you. Um, uh, find out what they are contributing right now and recognize that. Uh, that's great what you're doing. Um, make sure you include them in assessments. Record their points of view in the files. 
really simple. Make appointments when they can attend. If they are working, um, you foreclose the opportunity for a father-inclusive approach if you keep it 8.30 to 4.30. Um, provide support and resources to go further. I'm not sure um, exactly, and I think it's kind of an open research question. It's one of the reasons I was asking Mariana how, how fathers learned, is how, how do fathers learn to be better fathers? Their own fathers, if they're really lucky, might be a good role model. But I bet in a whole bunch of cases that's not true. Um, they're working out something that they didn't have, that they want to do better in for their kids. Um, so how do you learn? I think my partner and my mother actually have probably been the biggest influences on my fathering. Uh, if I think of my moments of frustration, um, it's talking it through with my partner, or it's my mother saying, try this. Um, I think one of the most important reasons that social workers and child welfare should engage with fathers is because if you don't deal with him in one family, he pops up in another. And regretfully, the data shows that most of the abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, on balance, occurs to children in, by the men slash fathers. That's the complexity with which we have to deal with.